Homo sapiens. He is born into the world, but that is merely his beginning. At birth, the complex machine of man is built, yet to function, that machine requires still further development a matter of years of learning and practice to create knowledge and skills. These are stored in the brain, the nerve center, which controls the body as well as the mind. The end result of all things stored, a human being, unique, independent, individual. With the start of life, the automatic functions of the body are set in motion by that part of the nerve center which controls them. Thus, the heart beats baby breathes. As life continues, the child sees, learns to recognize objects, color, light, and darkness. The other senses take form. The child hears, smells, tastes, feels. And as he grows, he learns to use his body. He walks, runs, feeds himself, throws a ball, works machinery, drives a car. All through the process of growing and living, he gains knowledge, learns right from wrong, learns to live with other people, develops inhibitions that protect him from himself. Each part of the brain develops in its own time, until at maturity, the machine of man is complete. A human being is developed. But the kind of human being depends upon the sum total of all the knowledge and skills that time and experience have stored in the brain. Much of this depends upon what the individual himself has decided to put there for his own use. What will a man be? Doctor, secretary, scientist, truck driver, thief, swindler, skid row bum, this is determined in the years of living. It is not fated at birth. For in the beginning, God created man in his own image. There is laughter and hope as the young baby emerges for the first time into the bright, warm sunlight. But for this girl, the laughter will die, the light will fade. For this is the story of a junkie, a hype. It is the beginning of an 18-year journey into hell. But how is such a journey made? when the beginning is perfection. With the growing years, her mind and body take form. She begins making the decisions that will shape her future. Mother! Mom! Sorry, I won't be able to get home to dinner again tonight. Forgot about the club meeting. Plenty in the refrigerator. Father called. He'll be home next week. See you tomorrow. Mother. With each new year, the decisions become more complex. And sometimes they become mixed and entwined with emotions that distort and destroy the facts. Loneliness, fear, misunderstanding, anger, defiance, or just a natural curiosity. These emotions take command as the young mind probes and experiments with life. She is hungry and eager to grow into the cherished dream of adulthood. But that goal is unchanneled. The adult tools which are available symbolize for her the arrival into the grown-up world, a dream world where dependency is ended and loneliness can be conquered. And adding appeal to the situation, the unsupervised adolescent playing the make-believe role of adult easily finds companions to join in the game and perhaps introduce new rules. Narcotics addiction frequently follows a pattern of gradual use of different drugs. Often the introduction comes in the form of a goofball. These are barbiturates. Ones in common use are Secanol, Nembutal, and Luminol. These are legitimate medications when prescribed by a physician who understands their use and potential dangers. Barbiturates are sedatives and hypnotics with depressant effects. To help offset the sedative effect, barbiturates are sometimes taken in conjunction with amphetamines or pep-up pills such as benzedrine and dexedrine. These are opposites and the body struggles to maintain a state of normal reactions.
Once in the system, barbiturates go to work on the nerve center. A dulling curtain shades reality. Thought becomes slow, confused, and judgment is defective. Emotions are unstable. The drug continues to work deeper into the nerve center. Walking lacks normal coordination. Other motor areas are dulled and activity is confused. Tremors often result. The senses are affected. The eyes oscillate involuntarily and it becomes difficult to hold a fixed position. If pep up pills are taken at the same time, opposing forces attack the brain. Instability increases in both thought and action. Both drugs are physically dangerous. The addict takes a chance so that he can feel high. But he is not high. He is confused, for he has drugged and distorted the knowledge and skills that life and time have given him. Escape, a flight from reality. She has found a crutch to see her through her difficulties, instead of facing up to them and learning to cope with them. She has made her decision. In time, as her problems grow, her need for the crutch will grow. She will search for something different, something better. Jive, marry, pot, tea. Technically, it's cannabis sativa, the common name, marijuana. Though often packed in real tobacco cans, this dangerous drug is easily distinguished from tobacco by its rough texture and greenish color. And the sticks, joints, or reefers, as the cigarettes are often called, are easily recognized alongside a tobacco cigarette. Marijuana is consumed in its own special way. It is not smoked by accident. Thus, the novice being taught how to use the drug by a pusher has made her own decision, and another step toward hell is taken. Marijuana enters the blood through the lungs. The drug is carried in the bloodstream to the brain. The effect comes quickly, with the drug attacking first the area in which learned behavior is stored. A cloud forms, hazing out the years of conscience, inhibitions, judgment. The user loses the protection of experience and common sense. The attack continues, moving in upon the area of the senses. Sight and sound and touch become distorted. With continued use, the drug will work deeper into the areas controlling the automatic body functions, and physical impairment follows. When smoking, the user is in an unreal world. He lives and reacts to illusions, to things as they appear to his clouded mind not as they really are. Dimensions and depth perception are greatly affected by this drug. A single step may appear as a cliff. Time perception is also distorted. Time is suspended and fast action appears slow. Danger is ever present. Narcotics users form a tight and frightened society of their own. Their code is secrecy and suspicion. The marijuana smoker, unlike most other narcotic users, prefers company when smoking the drug. Thus, so-called tea parties are common events. It is inevitable that with the passage of time, the user will drift into a group and become enmeshed in the silent society of fear. When introducing the drug, the pusher offered the reefers free. But in time, the novice begins to feel the need for the marijuana. And the pusher knows the free ride is over. He has a paying customer. She has come to depend more and more on the escape offered by the drug. To face each new problem, she needs the crutch. She searches him out. She needs one now. She's way down, a demanding mental craving. The deal is set, the buy is made. But she needs a place to consume the drug, 
for fear and suspicion are part of her life now. Earlier, the pusher sold reefers to the group now gathered in the alley. He was their connection. He tells the girl of the tea party now in progress, and she goes eagerly to join in. Narcotics addiction offers peculiar enforcement problems, for police officers must seek out not only the criminals, but the victims of the crime, the users. Here, a car secluded in a dead-end alley has aroused the suspicion of enforcement officers. They move in to investigate. The bust is made, swift arrest. The girl escapes by seconds. Yet, paradoxically, arrest might have been her only hope. For in the world of narcotics, there are no real escapes, only endings. Again, she is faced with a decision. But now her decision is twisted by her membership in the Society of Addicts. She hurries to warn the others of the arrest. The apprehension of any member of the group sets off panic among the others. They know that a single narcotics arrest often sets off a chain of other arrests. The pusher, the owner of the malt shop and a heroin addict, who also sells the stuff, confer. The marijuana pusher gives his supply to the girl, convincing her that she won't be suspected. In reality, he is putting her into jeopardy to protect himself. If they're caught, she will have the evidence and he'll be clean. And they run, leaving the frightened girl with the tea on her person. The heroin addict sees his chance. He offers the girl a place to hide, a place where she'll be safe. In her fear, she accepts. But one victim has cooperated. The chain reaction begins. In the depths of the city, the addict leads his hopeful conquest to his pad. The girl, though uneasy in these surroundings, is driven by fear. It is a typical dwelling of a height. He needs only a roof. All other money must be reserved for the most important thing in life, heroin. Behavior approaching paranoia is characteristic of the addict. Upon entering a room, he locks the door, pulls blinds, and checks other rooms to assure himself that he is not being watched. Assured of safety, he turns his attention now to the girl. His first move is to calm her and gain her confidence. He suggests that they blast a stick or two. This is the first step in his cautious plan. His real goal is to introduce her to heroin. This is a typical operation. Get a few girls hooked and dependent upon him for their daily ration of stuff. In return, they work for him, usually as prostitutes. Thus, they get their heroin, and he has an income. The hype is long past receiving any real effects from marijuana. His body is conditioned to the most powerful drug of all, heroin. But for the moment, he will play the game and feign friendship. Beyond the shabby rooms, swift action is the key. With the help of information gained in the original arrest, officers close in on the marijuana pusher. His planned escape with more of his merchandise is cut short. He tries to lose the evidence, but without success. And the enforcement net begins to close on the upper echelons of the criminal ring. But even as officers strike at the heart of the problem, a new victim is being lured into the trap of addiction. High, high as a kite. The marijuana has done its job well. She can be led now, ready to go along. Casually, he introduces the idea of something stronger, real kicks. He is careful to imply that it's only for himself. The marijuana has taken her beyond the protection of normal fear. The outfit, the addict's closest companion. He will usually keep several hidden in different locations. It sometimes consists of a hypodermic syringe, but more often a medicine dropper substitute. The needle, a spoon, and a small wad of cotton. All sanitary precautions are ignored. And hypes often contact venereal diseases, tetanus, hepatitis, and other infections transmitted into their blood by a dirty needle. 
three caps. He chooses two for his own fix, saving one in the hope that his plan succeeds. He plays on her curiosity. To prepare the solution, he first empties the contents of the caps into the spoon. Heroin comes at a high price, and every tiny grain of the stuff is precious to the hype. Anything spilled must be retrieved. A few drops of water are added, just enough to make a solution. It's mixed and dissolved. He leads her step by step into participation, depending upon the effects of the tea to keep the air of fun a game. A small wad of cotton is placed in the solution to serve as a filter. The stuff is drawn into the dropper through the cotton. The cottons used several times are saved, and later, should he be caught short and in need of a fix, the hype will cook the cottons for what small quantity of the drug they contain. The pop is ready, and the needle is put in place. Preparations for the actual shot are normally made in a matter of a few seconds. He usually ties the tourniquet with his teeth and one hand. Now, though, he asks for help, thus making her participate, drawing her in, preparing her. Her normal reaction would probably be fear, perhaps revulsion. But the marijuana is in command now. The years of learned judgment, common sense, inhibitions are fogged out. The hype relies upon this heavily. At his careful suggestion, she joins eagerly in the game. The needle has pierced the vein, and he directs her to loosen the tourniquet to allow the blood to flow. He finishes with a flourish, minimizing the unpleasant aspects. And he builds his feeling. The real kicks. But nobody wants to get high by himself. Why doesn't she fly with him? He can fix her a little pop. Another decision. But this time the facts are distorted and blurred. Now in custody and with a case built against him, the young pusher offers information. He knows a hype, a pusher. There's a girl with him, probably at his pad. He gives the address. Having a previous arrest, the addict pusher is identified from a mugshot. This is the crucial moment in the hype's plan. He must be persuasive without frightening her. She is wary, has a natural fear of a needle, has heard of those who get hooked. He uses a common argument. Only squares get hooked. Be an occasional user, a chippy. Just take a pop when you want something to take you out of this world. The idea entices her, a real escape. Curiosity, participation, and now use. Officers are dispatched to apprehend the addict. And the chain pattern of arrests that is familiar in narcotics cases continues. The careful gradual introduction nears a payoff. When no needle is available, an addict may cut the vein with a razor blade and literally pour the stuff in with the bare dropper. With the needle well inserted, the drug is injected. The main line. Here the blood indicates that the spike has hit the mark, the vein. This is the high point in this secret and distorted society dedicated to self-destruction and the beginning of the final chapter in the 18-year journey into hell. The effects will begin almost immediately. For the drug travels quickly with the flow of blood to the brain. All areas are attacked almost simultaneously, for heroin is a total cerebral and spinal depressant. All activity in the nerve center slows down. Even the automatic body functions are affected as pulse and breathing become retarded. Where other drugs distorted reality, heroin blocks out the outside world, leaving the addict in a world of his own. In a short time, the brain adjusts to this new subjective world, this world of slow motion, of dull lights and soft sounds. It's a colorless world, gray and drab, without feeling or sensations. 
pupils of the eyes contract. A feeling of drowsiness sets in. The brain can no longer cope with the normal world of sound and light and feeling. Out of this world? In truth, it is the beginning of the end. For of all those who dare to take this treacherous journey on the main line, less than 2% ever return. Another addict, the convert of a former day, is in need of a fix. She gives the knock known to her supplier. The junkie opens to no one until he is prepared. The evidence is quickly rolled into the cloth and placed on the girl's lap. If it should be arrayed, the stuff would be in her possession, not his. Even though the intruder is one of his girls, she is not welcome. She could smash the plan that has gone so well until now. But she is in the first stage of withdrawal. A fix is imperative. He must take the chance. In his favor, the new conquest is beyond rational thought and reason. Normal human emotions are in a void. Even though she knows the horror that awaits the novice, another girl means more money for the group and less work for her. Withdrawal begins with the general feeling of an approaching cold, running nose and watering eyes. The cold grows worse as the body, accustomed to the depressant gray world of the drug, returns toward normality. The eyes are up, dilated. Light pierces, stabs the eyes, and the smallest noise is excruciating as the nerves and senses are laid bare. The mere cold advances to flu symptoms. The addict soon comes to learn that when the symptoms appear, a fix is the one hope, or within a few hours the body will be helpless. Nausea, violent coughing, and retching join the pattern. But now, even in the midst of misery, a smile to the novice. A smile wrought from a memory in the vague past. For each victim of this slavery once knew freedom. Engaged. A happiness I couldn't accept. How many times in these years have I wondered why I rejected all that? To taste life, excitement, kicks. And then the night I got high, the pattern was cut. And now never to go back. Never to return. The stuff has been laid out, and he gives her the used, unsterilized outfit to take her fix. He has left the caps in the bathroom, a move calculated to get her away from the younger girl. But the scene of growing horror has unfolded before imperceptive eyes. He hurries now to take the novice out since he knows that there may be an even greater storm before the drug has a chance to bring the calm. The first shot of heroin usually results in nausea. He knows that activity will only tend to increase the sick feeling, but he chooses that over letting her witness withdrawals. The addict in the midst of withdrawal from the drug is in a race with time. Each minute is another step toward helplessness. Moving in to apprehend the addict and small-time peddler, officers miss their target by minutes. But they can nevertheless strike a blow at the silently growing cancer of misery and crime. <laughs> Aware that the room is occupied, they prepare the surprise that is essential to a narcotics arrest. <laughs> Addicts often try to swallow their heroin supply if apprehended. It is almost a reflex action, one of the basic laws of the hell in which they exist. The place is searched for other occupants. The doors of hell swing wide open to draw the addict in as she continues to kick. The physical tortures grow with each minute, for the body's demand for heroin is no mere desire, but a driving madness, a compulsion that cannot be satisfied except with the drug itself. And heroin is so dangerous and so powerful that its importation, even for medical purposes, has been outlawed in America since 1925. To further establish this girl's addiction to hard stuff, the officers check her arms. Here the hype wears the telltale marks of the habit. In response to the compulsion, the veins must be punctured with several injections each day. The fix is usually taken on the inside of the elbow. But in time, the vein will collapse and the hype generally ties off further and further down the arm. 
As the entire vein becomes impossible to tap, the other arm is used. Then the search for other veins begins. Scar tissue like this forms on the veins after continued use, creating a snake or track. Older hypes use veins on the backs of hands, in the fingers, and even between the toes. When arrested, addicts will often try to scratch or burn the scars, since they can be used in evidence against them. No one else inflicted these wounds. It was her own decision, one in the long road of decisions that led her to deform and disfigure her own body. <laughs> The dulling veil of the drug continues to lift, and every normal experience is agonizing. Yawning joins the pattern of nausea and retching. Vicious pains begin to grow in the spine and quickly spread into the limbs. Addicts describe these pains as being worse than having the limbs torn off. They often clutch and tear at themselves in an effort to divert the torment. Sudden chills sweep over the entire body. Anyone witnessing withdrawals is torn with compassion, but she is beyond the help of these officers. Retching grows worse. Vomiting begins. The chills are suddenly displaced by raging heat. The body feels as if it is literally on fire. The final move is always to the floor, which provides some sort of security. A new, intangible pain creeps over the entire body, a strange torture just under the skin. The addict will suffer another three to five days, unable to sleep day or night, before the racking pain begins to subside. This is the root of the addict's compulsion, a compulsion to lie, cheat, steal, even kill, to avoid the long living hell of withdrawal. But the seeds of addiction blow in the silent wind, and those seeds have taken new root in this girl. She has escaped detection, and she drifts on carrying the problem with her, treading the final steps of her 18-year journey into hell. She is not free, but bound in slavery to the drug. It is the sum total of her life, her experience, her learning, her decisions. All the industry of living is devoted to one end, a pop, a shot, a fix. Nothing else in life has meaning. She will sell all her possessions and finally herself in her drive for drugs. The body builds a tolerance to heroin so that larger and larger daily quantities are required to satisfy the physical demand. The cost of the habit increases. 50, 75, 100 dollars a day are needed to keep going. She will resort to any ends when even murder becomes preferable to the constant overhanging threat of withdrawals. But detection comes in time. And the young girl whose own decision was escaped from the burdens of normal living becomes an entry on a police blotter. The journey is over. She's hooked, a junkie, hype. There is no future. Soon the cold symptoms will commence, the growing tortures of long sleepless days and nights. And a hype knows better than anyone that this is the last of hope. This is the end. Thank <laughs> you.